Evening live from the John Hammond Street Digital Address, DA 006-6714, Adisawi Kanda in Accra. This is News at 10. You can hear me live on 3FM 92.7 as well as streaming on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. And I'm Stephen Enti. Uh, let's uh, start with the major news highlights of the day. Now, victims of flood and other disasters may have to brace themselves up for delayed relief support. As Natmo says, it may not be in the position to extend help for lack of resources. The National Disaster Management organization says its 34 million CD debt coupled with lawsuits has rendered it empty to fight disasters. Also tonight Ghana loses billions of CDs in productive hours through traffic translating into about 10.5 percent of the country's gross domestic product. Experts say this is the time to expedite efforts in reviving the rail sector and the bus rapid transit system to save us from the huge revenue losses. And tonight, the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture says it will not tolerate any person or group of persons who will resist the closed fishing season directive. The sector minister, Elizabeth Afole Kwe, warned violations of the directive would attract sanctions. And still, tonight, the Ghana Revenue Authority has begun the implementation of a fixed exchange regime at the country's ports. The Abosio Kai Spare Parts Dealers Association told TV3, although they are enjoying this benefit, they will only reduce prices if the reduction in benchmark values of imports announced by the Vice President captures spare parts. So those were our major news highlights. Remember, we're streaming live on our Facebook page. You can also hear us on 3FM 92.7. Up next is the big one. Welcome back. Now, the MP for Second D, Andrew Kofi Ijapa Mesa, says that three girls who were kidnapped in Takradi must be brought to their families if the police indeed claims knowing their whereabouts. Uh, two weeks ago, the Police Criminal Investigations Department, CID, revealed it has partnership with the Bureau of National Investigations, BNI, and has established the whereabouts of the three Takradi girls who were kidnapped, but nothing has since been heard about them. The Police Criminal Investigations Department, CID, is under pressure to produce the missing girls in Takrade two weeks after the CID boss indicated they know their whereabouts. We've worked very well and currently we know where the girls are. We are working hard together with other stakeholders so that these girls are brought back home safely. The assurance to the family is that they should keep on keeping on. The ladies, they will know where they are and they are safe. So very soon, they will be brought back home and they will go back to their family. But days after the April 2 press conference by the CID, the girls are yet to be reunited with their families. Many have questioned the rationale behind the CID boss's motive for putting out that sensitive information when the girls are yet to be brought home. Speaking on TV3's New Day, Second D Member of Parliament, Ejapa Mesa, said the three girls must be brought to their families if indeed the police claims about finding them are true. He added the calls for someone of the minister is in the right direction, emphasizing the girls must be reintegrated with their families once they are found. Some closure ought to be brought to this matter one way or the other. If you know where they are, then the assurance that I get from that statement is that they are alive. Right. If they are alive. Why are they where they are as we speak? Okay. They ought to go back to their families. You I've heard the Minister of Gender also say that uh, the police are on top of the game. Uh, okay. Of course, the police is under the supervision of the Interior Ministry. And so it may be useful for, if not the entirety of Parliament, for the Committee of Interior and uh, uh, the Gender people to get together and, and get the ministers to answer some questions.
Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George, agreed that the police must answer and justify their announcement on the girls, expressing confidence in the quality of the Ghana Police Service. There needs to be a certain, a certain decision that, look, this ends now. Mm -hmm. This ends this week. Mm -hmm. If we think that the girls are being held in such a position that, and again, I doubt it, but that the Ghana Police Service does not have the ability, the Ghana Armed Forces does not have the ability to go in and retrieve the girls and guarantee their safety, uh, we have multilateral and bilateral relations with some of the countries that are experts at hostage situations. Mm. We should have reached out to them by now. Prisla Blessing Bentum, 21, went missing on August 17 last year at Kansarodo in the Efiakwe Simintim municipality, whilst Ruth Love Kwesen, 18, went missing on December 4 last year at Butumajebu Junction in Sekendi Takrade. The third victim, Prisla Kranche, 15, went missing on December 21 at Ngrofo. One suspect, Samuel Udoetuk Wills, is currently standing trial for escaping police custody. As I listen to the coordinator of the West African Network for Peace Building, WANEP, Albert Yeleyang, who spoke with my colleague Alfred Okansi earlier on News 360. Is it fair to say that the demand for the CID to come out and tell us where they are is indeed in the right direction? Uh, yes, uh, good evening. I think that basically the demands are in place uh, because um, this is quite some sign that uh, we have been waiting anxiously to know where these girls are, whether they are safe, what they are doing and all of that. And so the demand to have more information uh, might be in the right direction, but maybe how we do this is also very important. Uh, in order that we do not put out so much information in the public domain uh, that these uh, kidnappers may also, uh, uh, who are monitoring all the media communication, you know, and doing all their investigation to also know whether they are being tracked you know, and but whether but they are being able to navigate all the trappings of the security to get the girls released. Um, might get to know such information and may restructurize. So I think that the demands uh, right in place, and especially that when um, the CID board did indicate that uh, they knew, the security knew where the girls are, you know, and for about two weeks uh, we are still waiting to have information. But so let's be very cautious. Um, such activities are done in a way that you know, it can be difficult for the security to be able to just immediately get you know a hold of the situation so uh, she indicated it might be that okay let's strategize very well mm. in order that we do not endanger the, the, the girls uh, who might be in the custody of the but uh, on, on the bit of, of strategy, um, respectfully, Mr. Yayang, is, um, you, you made the point that the, the kidnappers would certainly change their strategy if, if we put out too much information. But the CID boss coming to say, look, we know where they are and they are safe. Is that not enough information to the kidnappers to have re-strategized and maybe even change their location? If, if what you're saying is anything to go by. Uh, like I, I indicated earlier, the, for us, our demands, you know, should be done in the, in the information, information coming, you know, in response to our demands, should be done in a way that uh, does not also put the girls in danger. Um, yeah, I would expect a certain level of uh, uh, decorum, uh, let me say, uh, retrospection, you know, in uh, dealing with this, that we are not just giving all the information out there. Uh, much as probably we think we might be trying to let the general public know that we are on top of our game and that we are working uh, in terms of ensuring that every Ghanaian and every resident in this country is safe, you know, and, and is not kidnapped. We should do so in a manner that the, just a select few might be interested, might be uh, relevant in giving out this information. For instance, I would expect a kind of bilateral communication. Right to the families of the, uh, the, the, the victims, and then also some key 
people or groupings, uh, for instance, if parliamentary caucus on security would require this, then that select group, you know, is giving the information. So bilateral communication, you know, it would be uh, appropriate for me at this time. Right, so let's now get onto the telephone lines and speak to uh, a relative of one of the missing girls, uh, Nanajwa Kwesen, uh, who joins us on the telephone lines. Uh, Ms. Kwesen, thank you extremely for uh, joining us. I know that this must be a very traumatic moment for you and your family, but I want to know whether you have, along the line, since the last uh, press conference from the CID boss, whether you've heard anything at all from the police. Hello, Ms. Kwesen. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah, good. So I'm saying that I'm asking if uh, since the last press conference by the CID, you have heard anything about your sister and the other missing girls from the police? No, we haven't. After the press conference, I think uh, two days after the press conference, we contacted the CID boss and we asked how far the situation is in. She sent us a message that the BNI are still working on it, so she keep on praying. Hopefully, by very soon, we will see our sister and other girls. That's what she told us. Mm, so, the, the request for prayer, I know that uh, the comments must have given you some hope. I'm wondering whether you are still hopeful that your sister and the other girls are alive. Yeah, for the hope, we had that since uh, January when the gender minister came out and said that she has confided in, with the guy, and the guy confirmed in that the girls are still alive and they are still in the country. But since that time, we never heard anything about it again until this recent uh, press conference that the CID boss to came out with it that they have found mm. the girls, they know where the girls are. Mm. So very soon they reunite with their family. So, so we are hopeful, we know they are there. So I don't know what is keeping them long for them to bring them back. We don't know what's going on. So we've decided that maybe by the course of this week, if we don't see anything, then we will take our next action. So when you say take your next action, I know that some uh, few days ago, the family threatened to embark on a, a series of protests and demonstrations against uh, government or the police service over this. Uh, so when you say your next line of action, what exactly are you hoping to do? Uh, we are hoping to come to our car and come and ask questions and answers to some because you just can't come out with a press conference and tell all the news that you know what the case and it means to is and so still no news. Then we need to demand uh, some answers from you. So we just come to the office and question them because we don't know what they are doing about it. It's been two weeks now. Mm. I, I, I want us to go back a little bit to the early stages when your sister and the other girls were kidnapped. Uh, what was the response? Did the kidnappers contact you and ask you for money? Yeah, yeah, he did. That was uh, Samuel Wills. He called oh, you, you were able to confirm out. that it was Samuel Wills who called? Yeah, or it was it relatives was of his? Voice, yeah, because we recorded some of his calls with us. It was the same voice that was speaking at the court. Yeah, it was the same person. Okay, so they made demands of like 4,000. I remember uh, you told us that they asked for 4,000 or 3,000. Yeah, then 10,000. Interesting. 10, so what, what kind of conversation did you have? I know that the police is investigating this, but we also want to have a fair idea of the kinds of uh, processes they took you through when they were trying to extort money from you. Uh, did you keep engaging them or you stopped at a point? No, we did not stop because as soon as we received a call from my sister for then we visited our CID and we told him that, oh, this is what that is saying, this is what he is demanding. He would be like, no, we should ignore him. But still, the guy would be, he would be calling. I, I think a day she, he calls more than ten times. And after he received the money, then the phone goes off. Mm. Interesting. Uh, so r right now, uh, you are saying that you'll be coming to Accra to continue with the protest. Are you hopeful that this will bring any results for you? Yeah, we are very hopeful because for now that no one is telling us anything. I think it will be the right thing for us to come to Accra because even if you ask, 
she will be she will be telling that the BNI are working on it. So I think the BNI are those doing the job. So maybe if possible, we have to come to the BNI office at Accra. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nanajo Akwesen is one of the uh, one of the sisters of one of the kidnapped girls. Uh, Miss Quayson, who has been gone for some time now. This is still a news at 10. We're live from the news hub at Adesawe Kanda. When we return from the break, we'll be telling you about NDC's uh, claim of government uh, harassment and uh, politically motivated persecutions. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. Uh, we're live on 3 of 92.7 as well. Welcome back. Now, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, has condemned what it describes as the politically motivated persecution of its officials, uh, cynically disguised as lawful uh, prosecution. In a statement issued by the party and signed by its General Secretary, Johnson Isidun it noted that the NDC finds it curious that the Chief Justice, having created the divisions uh, for the High Court, uh, will fully constituted criminal division the case of his national chairman will be assigned to a justice at the commercial division of the high court And so with the NDC, the, the party is accusing government of reckless management of funds of the National Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, at uh, media engagement, the NDC said it has evidence showing an amount of over 17 million CDs of NHS funds have been invested in a fixed deposit with All Time Capital Limited, and the company is unable to pay back. Communications Officer of the National Democratic Congress, Sami Jemfi, said an amount of over 17.5 million CDs was invested in three tranches with All Time Capital without due diligence. The party said All Time Capital has been unable to pay back the money and interest accrued to the NHIS because it is experiencing challenges in redeeming its own investments from other parties. It has therefore asked the investment to run for another year to be able to fully settle its obligations. Upon President Akufuadu assuming office, the National Health Insurance Authority, without any due diligence and with indecent haste, transferred a whopping 17 million 578,370 Ghana cities and 20 pesos in three tranches to a private financial house, All Time Capital Limited, supposedly as investment. Despite repeated efforts by the scheme since November 2018 to retrieve the invested funds and accrued interest, All Time Capital Limited has failed to pay back this money. Sami Jemfi further indicated that since the NPP took over, active membership and subscription has declined between 2016 and 2018. Active membership in the National Health Insurance Scheme over the last two years. So you can see that in 2016, when our brothers in the NPP made a lot of noise that the National Health Insurance Scheme had collapsed, active membership in the scheme was a total of 10 million 786,000, representing a nationwide coverage of 39%. Then in 2017, that figure has reduced from 10,786,000 people to 10,422,000 people, representing a nationwide coverage of 37%. Again, 2018, active membership in the scheme reduced from 10 million 422 million people in 2017 to 10 million 410,000 people representing a nationwide coverage of 35 percent. The NDC added that while active membership is declining, compensation payment to staff of the authority is increasing. And victims of flood and other disasters may have to brace themselves up for delayed relief support. As Nadmo says, it may not be in the position to extend help 
uh, due to lack of resources. The National Disaster Management Organization says it's 34 million CD debt uh, coupled with a few suits, lawsuits has rendered it empty in, to fight disasters. At the time of the audit, there was no fire policy at the NADMO headquarters, like the auditors said. The stark difficulty the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, has been bedeviled with. There was a debt of 34 million of relief items, of which we are still paying. And therefore, when you write to finance to give you money to procure new items, Finance will give you money, but you have to use majority to pay for the 34 million, which as I sit here right now, I have about 28 court cases. The rains are in earlier than expected and many have already been displaced. The very existence of NADMO as a relief organization has been threatened. NADMO as a state organization do not have even a single warehouse in this country. Even at the headquarters, we have something small that we give small things. The rest of the things we buy, we keep them in national security warehouses, even at the headquarters. So going to the region, there's no region in this country where we have warehouses that we can procure uh, relief items and keep for the organization. Appearing before the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament on infractions in their books in the Auditor General's report, the Interior Minister Ambrose Derry says despite the shortfalls by the organization, it has been able to provide relief victims in need. I heard that a number of lives have been lost and the first reaction that we should have taken is action we should have taken is to go around to see what we can do. But of course we have to come and attend to this. With the Director General, we're going to see what we can do. I'm going to finance to see whether we are well suited to get these things done. But of course, whatever we do won't bring about the lives of these people. So I would like to express our condolences to the families that have been affected. In need also to appear before the Public Accounts Committee on Monday was the Petroleum Commission, PSC Tema Shipyard and the Shippers Council. Revenue Authority has begun the implementation of a fixed exchange regime at the country's ports. The Abusilkai Spare Parts Dealers Association told TV3, although they are enjoying these benefits, they will only reduce the prices of uh, their, their, their products if the reduction in benchmark values of imports announced by the Vice President captures spare parts. George Quaining reports. The fixed exchange rate regime has ensured the pegging of the dollar at 5 CDs, 0.8 pesos at the port for the purposes of trading for the next three months. It implies that stakeholders will benefit for the next quarter until another review is done. Key stakeholders, including importers, have lauded this move as a relief for their businesses. Prior to this, uh, this announcement by the vice president, you know, Guta, which Abasokai is part of it, had met the uh, Council of State, Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Trade. And uh, as part of the recommendations that we put out there, we suggested that this, uh, the pegging of, of the dollar, uh, either quarterly or six months, you know, will go a long way to help us because it will enable you, the businessman or the importer, one, to make projections and also to plan and also to make prices a bit stable. Despite the relief, co-chairman of the Abosokan Spare Part Dealers Association, Clement Boatin, warned there will not be a reduction in prices until the reduction in benchmark values on import captures spare parts. Currently, goods that we've, we've, we've cleared since you know since the announcement was made, we are not enjoying the, 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 the yes we are not enjoying the fifty percent you know reduction. We are still paying uh, what uh, we, we, we used to pay. So, if it is implemented and we also come into the picture and we enjoy the 50 percent, I promise the public that we will definitely reduce our goals. Meanwhile, the association is to meet with the Ghana Revenue Authority on April 17 to explore whether the reduction in benchmark values of imports will capture spare parts. On April 3, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Dubamia announced an immediate drastic reduction in the benchmark values against which duties paid by importers are calculated. The benchmark or delivery values of import, with the exception of vehicles, effective April 4, have been reduced by 50%, while that for vehicles will be reduced by 30%. Vice President said the measures were designed to reduce the menace of smuggling and make the country's port more competitive and attractive. 
And that's how we wrap up with News at 10. Thanks very much uh, for staying with us. On behalf of the crew, good night. Uh, there is more news on 3news.com.